Good afternoon, it's good to be here. Um, as Aurelien said, I'm going to talk about how we've taken Austria in a slightly different direction to what some of the other talks have been about. But a little bit about the Sanger Institute first. Um, founded in 1993, we were part of the Human Genome Project, the, the big push across the world to sequence the human genome and get that out into the public domain. Since then, the Institute has developed. We've widened our focus. We no longer just look at human genome. We look at mice and zebrafish, malaria, other pathogens. We're looking at cellular, cellular genetics, the internals of each cell, what controls it. And supporting all that, we've got a bunch of groups. IT is one of them, DNA pipelines, other supporting groups. Here is our lovely campus in Hingston. It's near Cambridge in UK. It's a beautiful place to work, but getting there is a pig because there's very little public transport. So our traditional environment is traditional. We're using LSF. It's a well-known batch scheduler. We've got about 20,000 cores running jobs underneath that. So our scientists like this. They know how to use POSIX file system. We're using Lustre. We've been using Lustre for many years, since version 1 point something. But there are some drawbacks with this approach. There's limited security. Isolation is based on POSIX file permissions. So you can't, uh, you can't give the user root on any of the compute nodes because they could just SU, they could sidestep this uh, protection and just access any data they wanted. So we were looking for what can we do to get around this. We also wanted to find a way to make our pipelines and software stacks more flexible. At the moment, they're complex, they're in house, they're homegrown. Reproducibility is hard if you've got scientists tinkering with a pipeline every day. You can't just rerun the data set and say, do we get the same results that we got last week if someone has, has, has been tinkering? So cloud. Cloud is the answer to everything. That's what they tell us. It brings a lot of benefits. Um, in the cloud, you can isolate tenants and projects very easily from each other. In particular, with OpenStack, looking at network isolation, it uses VXLAN or GRE to encapsulate tenant networks so they literally cannot see each other. The developers can do what they want. They have free reign, they have root, they can run any OS, they can run any software they want. So they're happy. And we can bring reproducibility to this apparent mayhem by talking about infrastructure as code. We're using things like Packer and Heat so that you can have a template for a software stack. As long as you don't tinker with a template, every time you deploy it, you will get exactly the same software coming out and, touch wood, the exact same analysis will be performed and you'll get exactly the same results. So this sounds great. There are some problems. As I said, we've got a lot of traditional and legacy code. It's all written in-house. Even the authors may have moved on. They may not be at the Sanger Center anymore. So we may have um, a lot of work to do in trying to bring this forward to the cloud model. Typically, uh, our pipelines require POSIX file systems. We've got a lot of NFS. We've got even more Lustre. But cloud workloads are typically using object stores, so get and put, rather than POSIX file semantics. We have, in the last few years, started deploying IRODS, an uh, integrated rule-oriented data system. That has got the scientists used to working with get and put and metadata. But still, there's a lot of POSIX out there. Sometimes we don't have the source code. We have the expertise to migrate code. We would like to have a way of um, encapsulating a workload and putting it into our cloud, our private cloud, without actually having to rewrite it if we can. Performance is also desirable. We used to nice, shiny, fast Lustre file systems. In the cloud, you don't always get that. Your workload may not be localized near the data. As I said before, we want to be able to give the tenant root. We want them to do anything they like inside their project area. This, of course, means they can impersonate any user. And because we want the moon on the stick, we want it to be simple. Place bets now. So a little bit about our history around OpenStack. We started experimenting about two years ago. We cobbled together some hardware. We started deploying. We had a little play. We didn't run away screaming, which is probably a good sign. Um, over the following year or so, we ran a, ran a pilot service. We had some enthusiastic early adopters. We had some guinea pigs. We had some failures. We had some successes. We managed to persuade the senior management this was a, a way to go. And they said, fine, here's some money. Go and build it. OK, we said, what can we get for this money? And late last year, we took delivery of the full-scale hardware for our production deployment. We opened that to the guinea pigs at the beginning of this year. 
opened it to the entire institute in February and it has been a roaring success, dare I say. We're now looking at the next situation. What are we going to do next? We're using a slightly old version of OpenStack. Old means mature, maybe. We're looking at a more recent version, which is still mature, but not bleeding edge. So a little bit of hardware porn, if we must. Uh, we went with Supermicro for the hardware. We've got 107 compute nodes. Yeah, you can read this as well as I can read it out. Um, the interesting thing to look at is while we're trying to encourage the developers to think in a cloudy style, so you may have things failing all over the shop, you know, instances may go down when you weren't expecting them, we are still building some of this with some resilience. So we've got bonded Ethernet, we've got dual power supplies, some of the usual things. Um, the OpenStack deployment requires three controller nodes for HA, so we spec out six so we can have, in this hardware, two deployments side by side. At the moment, we've got the production one, which we call Delta, and the next generation, which will be called Epsilon. We're using, as I said, we're using Red Hat's uh, OpenStack. It's the upstream Liberty version. That's Red Hat's version 8. Uh, there's a picture of a cab full of equipment there. The initial deployment was three of those cabinets. Um, one thing we were surprised by is that people really like using object storage, even if they're using uh, traditional workloads on the traditional compute farms. Because we made the object storage available to the rest of the network, not just to OpenStack, people can use it from there as well. So we've already upgraded from one petabyte usable of uh, up to nearly four and a half petabytes usable. Uh, that's using Ceph. The object storage layer is called the Rados Gateway, and it makes it look like AWS, Amazon's S3 storage. These are quite neaty boxes. They've got 60 spinny disks in. They've got two NVMEs. That's used for a journal. And we're using three-way replication. As I said, we started with three cabinets. So you write one copy, Ceph makes two further copies. We have to be careful when we say replication because some of our other data on site is replicated off site. This is just replication within the same data center. For networking, we've gone for Arista. The, the main driver for this is the VXLAN. That's the tunneling layer two in layer three. You could use GRE for this, but VXLAN gives you uh, many more possibilities. It's 16 million, something like that. Uh, we're not going to run out of uh, possibilities for encapsulating anytime soon. We've used VXLAN in two layers. One is to keep the layer two within each cabinet, so we don't have uh, overly large broadcast domains. The other is um, plugging into OpenStack for the software-defined networking. So the tenant networks, if you have a virtual machine in one rack talking to a virtual machine in another rack, that's going over an encapsulated network. Um, OpenStack can also talk to the switches directly through a plugin and configure the VLANs to arrive on which switch and are connected to which hypervisor. We hope in the future to use this to extend the tenant networking that's VXLAN encapsulated out to hardware so you can effectively deploy a virtual machine on bare metal. We weren't able to use that in the first iteration because there were some bugs in the Arista driver, but we've worked with Arista and we believe they're fixed now. We can probably skip this slide. So the hardware we're using for this proof of concept is it's a DDN system. It's a SFA 10K. It's got four OSSs. It, all the servers have got dual 10 gig networking. So we're looking at absolute headline eight gigabyte per second. And when it was in production with our traditional compute farms, we've seen six gigabyte per second of this. So it's, you know, it's, it's not new, it's not really ancient, it's perfectly acceptable. Uh, we're using a DDN version of Lustre 2.9 with one fix backported from 2.10. That's to do with a, a missing null terminated uh, <coughs> file system name, I think Sebastian found that for us. So an overview of the network. There's quite a lot of networking in there. We've got 100 gig in a lot of places. This is much more networking than we would ever put in for a traditional compute cluster. But because it's, it's cloud, we're expecting a lot more east-west traffic, so that's traffic between instances. And I'll come on to why we needed that later. At the top right, you can see the Lustre file system is connected into our uh, legacy core switch, two by 10 into each Lustre server. So we think, with all that background, we can use a couple of features in Lustre and some features of OpenStack to mash these worlds together. We can use... Um, the squashing feature of Lustre 2.9 and the subdirectory mount feature to say that each tenant can have all their I.O. squashed to a single new ID in Git, and we can have each tenant restricted to a single subdirectory of the Lustre file system. So the idea is 
Luster will protect them from each other, both in terms of user ID and GID, and also because they'll be constrained to their own subdirectory. They won't be able to see each other's data, and even if they could, they won't be able to access each other's data. As an aside, while this proof of concept treated our Luster file system only for OpenStack tenants, we might be able to use a Luster file system both for OpenStack and for a general HPC. That would need us to upgrade our existing clients to 2.9. At the moment, it's 2.5, so we can't go there. So this is what we're trying to build. On the left, you can see the blue and the red virtual machines. They belong to different tenants. Their tenant networks are encapsulated in VXLAN, so they can't see each other's packets. They can't see each other's virtual machines. Without any of the back-end network, the only way they can talk to each other is to go through the public network at the front, and that's through that. So the plumbing that OpenStack provides, the software-defined networking, is these provider networks at the bottom. These are provided by a VLAN that lives in the data center. So we are, we are naming these provider networks with the same UID that the Luster router uses for the user that we're squashing the data to. That sounds a bit convoluted, but it just means that we have a way, given a UID, we can track the naming all the way through. So in this layout, on the left, we've got virtual machines between uh, two tenants. We've got a physical Luster router and we've got physical Luster servers. The only way the tenants can talk to the Luster servers is through the Luster router. So we can use the Luster routing to separate the traffic. So the UID mapping is not something that I'd seen used before this project. I don't know how many other people are using it. So let's wade through some of the commands here and we'll talk about some of the features that it enables. So we create a node map for each tenant. This shows us which set of NIDs is mapped onto which set of UIDs and some other properties to do with that. We're turning off the trusted and the admin properties. That means that the tenants can't see the real UIDs on the back end and also that any root squashing is done because we don't trust the tenants. I mean, we do, they're our, they're our scientists, they're our friends, but we want to be able to use this for groups that might not be allowed to see each other's data due to NDA or whatever. We set the squashing so that each tenant is squashed to a different UID and a different GID. And it looks like duplication at the end. We also add an ID map to map user 1000 to the tenant UID. It looks like duplication, but we found we needed at least one ID map in the node map where it wouldn't take. We chose user ID 1000 because that's the default user in a typical cloud image. If you find an Ubuntu image, then your Ubuntu user will be UID 1000. So it's a convenience. On the Luster server side, we create the directory for the tenant's data, and we own it. Then we create a file set uh, with alcohol set from, and that shows us that this tenant is only allowed to use this subdirectory named after the tenant. We set a node map range so that the tenant's uh, traffic coming on, on the TCP number provider network gets mapped to this node map. Uh, it looks like we're allowing any IP address there, and that's correct. We don't care about the IP address. What we care is the TCP number that the data comes in on. That's what the router, the Luster router, is going to use to map the data at the end. Finally, we have to add a Luster route on the Luster servers so that they know to reach this cli these clients, they have to go through the Luster router. Equally, on the clients, to reach the Luster servers, they have to go through the Luster router. So that's the Luster side. Now we can dive into the OpenStack. Neutron is the software-defined networking component of OpenStack. It has a lot of different ways to create networks. Uh, we're going to create a shared provider network. So that's a network that can be, it's, it's an existing VLAN in the data center. It's provided by a VLAN. We could provide it by VXLAN, but in this case, VLAN is easier. It's, it makes it easier to break out to the physical world. Um, when we say which physical network it's going on, OpenStack has concepts of multiple different physical connections to a hypervisor or a controller. In our case, it's quite simple. We have a single physical connection. It's a bonded interface. And we've called that the data center. Finally, we tell it which segmentation ID, or in this case, the VLAN ID, to use for this traffic. So Neutron Net creates, that's like, here's a physical network, a piece of wire. On this piece of wire, we need to create a subnet. It doesn't matter which IP range we choose. We've kept them distinct per tenant so that we can tell from the IP addresses which tenant we're dealing with. We've done an enabled DHCP service, so OpenStack will provide DHCP addresses to clients on this network. That means when the users bring up their instances, the networking is configured automatically. 
There's no gateway. This is a private, isolated network between the lost router and the tenant virtual machines. We create a role, that's effectively a flag, that can be given to a user to say, this user is allowed to deal with this network with the OpenStack role create command. And then for each user that needs to create instances attached to this network, we use the OpenStack role add command to give them the role. It's quite useful that this is so fine-grained because you could have a power user within a project that's allowed to create these instances and create these network connections, but other users that only use the virtual machines, they're not allowed to do network plugging and unplugging. The OpenStack configuration is quite verbose. It's expressed in JSON. Um, even just the Neutron policy, that's the software-defined networking policy, is about 200 lines. We wanted to minimize the amount of change we made so we could automate this. So we changed one single rule, the get network rule, to change it to a local rule. We're using Ansible to do some automation, and that's a very easy change to make. It's just a few lines of Ansible. Then we define a new policy rule, the get network's local rule. The log logic here is a little bit contorted. We're saying a user can see a network if they are the admin or the owner of the network, or if it's the external network, or the context is advanced services. That's an internal feature to OpenStack. We're not using, we don't need to worry about it, but we keep it there for future expansion. Or if this is a provider network, these are the provider networks we're creating to carry the lust of traffic. Or if it's a shared network that is not a provider network, Shared networks is another feature we're not using. This is a way you can create an encapsulated network between two tenants. Finally, we actually do the, the bottom level definitions of which network is which. So LNet1 is a network with this UUID. So we say a user is allowed to see LNet1 if they have the role LNet1 OK and we're talking about network LNet1. Similarly, LNet2, you can define as many as you like of these. We defined a batch of eight to start with. Unfortunately, changing this policy requires a restart of Neutron, and that can be disruptive to the tenant's traffic, so we try and do that as little as possible. So now we've done the configuration, what are we going to plug in? We stole a hypervisor. This is massively over spec for the Lustre router. It's got way more CPU and memory than you would actually need. But it was convenient, and being physical, it's very easy to work out where the packets are going, which is a benefit when you're trying to debug things. So this Lustre router is one node, it's in a single cab, so any machines that are in different cabs that want to talk to it have to traverse the spine network. I said earlier we put in a lot more east-west networking than we would, and this is one of the reasons why we are able to pee back on this extra networking and not worry too much about the locality of the networking for the router. We didn't do any particular changes from the default settings. We didn't do any performance tuning either. When we're testing with client virtual machines, they're quite small. Uh, we're using CentOS rather than Red Hat purely so we didn't have to worry about Red Hat subscription management, subscribing and unsubscribing as these machines come up and go down. Each client virtual machine has two NICs. There's one on the tenant network and there's one on the provider network. Our testing procedure is VDBench. It's a fairly old, fairly well-known benchmark. It's not going to give us any surprises and it means that anyone else who wants to try and reproduce this has something they can easily uh, use in the same way. Again, we didn't do much performance tuning. We're looking for kind of baseline numbers here rather than speed records. We wanted to know as we changed configurations what happened. So here are some numbers. The first ones to look at, I guess, are the upper lines in each graph. That's bare metal client. That's treating the router as a simple client to the Lustre file system. And we're seeing above three gigabyte per second. So that's, that's quite respectable without any tweaking out of the box. The next lines to look at are the bottom ones. There's a cluster of four, green and blue. Those are virtual machine clients talking through the physical Lustre router to the Lustre file system. That performance, even a line for no performance tuning, is not very good, and we were quite dismayed by that. We went and talked to Arista, we went and talked to Mellanox. Mellanox said, you're using which kernel version? Upgrade, quick. So we upgraded, and that shows you the red and the yellow lines in the middle. That got us a factor of two or three improvement just by upgrading the kernel on the um, on all the machines in the stack. My performance, similar, it's acceptable, it's not stellar, but as a convenience, this is going to be more than good enough. Our users are already used to having VMware virtual machines connected to Lustre. They don't expect it to go fast, but they do expect it to get at the data. That's just summarizing the numbers we have in the previous graphs. When we started using multiple virtual machines to look at aggregate performance, 
The numbers are again looking quite good. We can get the aggregate performance up to about three gig per second on write. That's what we saw with the bare metal treating the router as a simple client. So we're quite happy with that. Less good when we're looking at read performance. Both the numbers are lower, but also the numbers are inconsistent across different runs. We don't yet have an explanation for this. We would like to redo some of these experiments and see what happens. So that was physical routers, but we're doing this cloudy. We could virtualize the routers as well, why not? There were some reasons for doing this and some reasons for not doing this. The reasons for doing this, every tenant can have their own set of virtual routers. This brings fault isolation, it brings data isolation. We can provision more routers and we can scale up very easily. If we template the routers, we can just click install, have another router. So that's no additional cost. Once you've done the upfront cost of setting up the template, it's quite easy to add more routers. Again, this would increase the ECS traffic because your client isn't necessarily going to talk to a virtual router that's even in, on the same hypervisor or even the same cab. That's okay, we have a lot of network. So this is the logical layout with virtual routers per tenant. It's very similar to as before. The difference is on the right-hand side, the dark, the dark cluster routers are now virtual machines. So the security is slightly improved. The traffic is not going through a shared router, so there's no chance that it can touch or be contaminated by someone else's data. Any efforts to compromise would have to break through a router and then through another router or to the file system before any data of a different tenant was reached. So we think this is, this is a step forward. It's not a big step forward, but it's useful. One thing we did find when setting up virtual buster routers, um, we had to disable an OpenStack feature called port security. Port security is an effort to prevent tenant virtual machines from doing things they shouldn't, spoofing their MAC address or acting as a rogue DHCP server, things like that. Now we didn't think these protections would have got in the way, but it turned out we had to turn off port security before we could use virtual master routers. It turns out there's a bug, a race condition in the liberty release of OpenStack. We can work around it by attaching the network interface to the instance at the time the instance is created. If you try and attach the network interface after the fact, you hit the race condition. So with virtual luster routers, the performance is, again, not so good as you might expect. You're paying the virtualization tax. But you can add more virtual routers very easily and mitigate that. So we're seeing up to about a gigabyte per second. Again, it's not a speed record, but it's con convenient access. Similarly for uh, random read and write performance. We did have a little accident when we were setting this up. At one point, we had the clients talking to one Luster router and the Luster file servers talking to a different Luster router. So effectively, we had asymmetric routing at the application level. Asymmetric routing is bad for various reasons. It makes it hard to debug your network if your traffic is not going the way you think it is. But also, it opens the door to certain attacks. If you've got a hostile system injecting data, then we found that the Luster server would accept packets from a place it wasn't expecting to. Even though the Luster server was expecting to talk to one set of routers, it would happily process packets from a different Luster router. We think this is probably a vulnerability. The way we can see to mitigate it is to use IP tables on the Luster servers so they only accept connections from the expected Luster routers. In a future iteration, we would expect to do that. So to conclude, we did it, it works. We can create isolated POSIX shared file systems using Luster 2.9 for OpenStack tenants. This is a great way as a stepping stone for us to give shared file systems to OpenStack clients. Performance is acceptable. We found that Luster routers don't need very much in the way of resources, so you can create as many as you like to scale up performance. Physical routers work and give you better performance. They also give better locality for network usage. So what we'd like to do next, we'd like to improve the automation. You've seen how many configuration steps were involved. Not many of those are automated yet, and there's lots of scope for typos. We need to check that in Newton, the next release we're going to deploy, the port security bug is fixed. And finally, we'll get around to improving performance. We haven't done anything with MTUs, we're still using 1400. We haven't looked at open vSwitch tweaks. We haven't looked at NIC ring buffer sizes. There are many things we can play with to try and make things better. Finally, I'd like to say thank you. DDN have been very helpful in supporting us with this. Uh, Sebastian and Thomas in particular. Richard and James were enablers and encouragers. At Sanger, James Beale did the legwork on the Luster side. John Nicholson did the networking. I provided encouragement and a little bit of OpenStack knowledge. Thanks for your time. Any questions? Thank you. Question? Hi. 
Uh, so in, in your benchmarks, you, you say you use 81 virtual machines. Do you know how many physical hypervisors uh, were used? That would have been 81 hypervisors as well. We took care to spread them one per hypervisor. Okay. And have you done any tests um, uh, with changing the size of VMs? So they were big VMs, small VMs? Uh, those were small VMs. Sorry, that's one detail, uh, detail I've lost over. If I rewind quite a long way, uh, we can see here. Oh, okay, yeah. So the, the bottom four, the, the bunch of lines together is for virtual machines of different sizes, all the way from two CPU, four gig of RAM, all the way up to 56 CPU, 500 gig of RAM, and the performance isn't affected by the virtual machines. It wasn't affected, okay. Did you say that, so there's a lot of setup involved in getting this yes. going, right? Did you say that you were hosting, uh, you know, some of the recipes that you had to put this together? Sure. Yep, so these slides will be available. We're going to put a white paper on that blog site that I mentioned at the end. Yeah, that would be fantastic. That's Thanks. Cool. This, this, is, I mean, this is basically rocket science to me. <laughs> right? um, yeah, we've got a, a 10-page white paper which is about to be published there, and that will have some of the recipes, some of the commands in it. So, um, so you seem pleased with the, both the SAP performance and the Lustre performance. Mm -hmm. in, in, uh, what, so what kind of things are you looking for next so in either each of those environments? So long term, a shared file system for OpenStack might not be Lustre, partly because it's a pain to set up, partly because the performance is you know, it's, it's impacted by virtualization and routing. Um, the OpenStack component to provide a shared file system, file system on demand is called Manila, but it's not mature yet. That can use CephFS under the hood, but that's not mature yet either. I know CERN are using it, but, but they're clever on us. Um, there are lots of places we could go. This is a good stepping stone for now. No more. No. Um, in your experience, how? Dynamically, uh, how dynamic the um, uh, file set feature can be? Uh, how dynamic does the file set be? Uh, once we set up the file set, then uh, we'll I mean, uh, we didn't touch it after the fact. I mean, can you uh, dynamically add new files or remove uh, nodes, add nodes and remove nodes from the uh, given file set? Are you thinking adding more routers? Effectively? Uh, no, clients. Clients. Sure, adding clients, yeah. Um, so we're looking at ways to template the clients because as the workloads, as the instances become managed more by scientists and system administrators, even system administra is administrators find it hard to manage Lustre. We want the clients to find it easy. So if we make a template for the client, they can just click, install the machine. It's got Lustre pre-configured with the router. Everything just works. That's the plan anyway. Question about uh, decommissioning um, VMs. Mm -hmm. So you did all that work to set up, you know, LNET one, LNET two, or whatever. Do you have, um, you know, how do you tear things down at the end? And okay, do you have so to restart Neutron every time you want to power off a virtual cluster? Okay. So the setup for the LNET one, the LNET two, that's setting up the node map and the role for a tenant. Once that's set up, you can bring up and tear down virtual machines at will. There's no change required at that point. The element one, the rules that I showed, is just to set up the policy and the framework. Okay, thank you, Dev. Thank you.